Today's presentation is Hunter Holmes McGuire, much more than Stonewall Jackson's surgeon. The presenter is Carl E. Heisch, MD, professor, and director of Sur surgical education and also associate dean of Brody School of Medicine. Professor Heisch has been at ECU for about 20 years. Here is Carl Heisch to speak on Hunter Holmes McGuire, much more than Stonewall Jackson's surgeon. Um, as I start, somebody asked me how I got interested in this. Um, I'm not Southern by a long shot. I grew up in Portland, Oregon, and Seattle. And um, why I asked Dr. Chitwood for advice, who's the co-author of this paper. Uh, the Southern Surgical Association has a yearly competition, and I'd heard uh, a number of papers given, and I said, well, I can do that. And so I went to Ranny and said, well, what should I do this on? And he said, Stonewall, or uh, Hunter Holmes McGuire. So that's really the genesis of this. Um, however, I, and not, as I mentioned, being Southern and uh, not being a Civil War buff, uh, I was much more interested in Dr. McGuire's um, academic career and his, um, and his educational stuff. As I've already mentioned, his uh, name is most commonly associated uh, with the Civil War and his friendship with Stonewall Jackson. He was uh, certainly uh, Stonewall Jackson's friend and confidant and cared for his uh, injury, which is, was inflicted, interestingly enough, by friendly fire. He did amputate his arm, uh, but then later, because of complications, uh, and uh, uh, as he was um, evacuated, he unfortunately was dropped um, by the people carrying him, developed pneumonia, and that's what caused his death. The two major biographies of uh, Dr. McGuire center on the Civil War, with one of them giving approximately 40% of its time uh, to the Civil War, and the other about 70%. Uh, my goal was to examine his life uh, from a much broader perspective and to focus on the contributions he made to American medicine as an expert surgeon, educator, writer, and uh, national and international leader, and hopefully I can convince you of that. <clears throat> um, the other things that are interesting about Dr. McGuire are that uh, his life basically spanned almost the entirety of the 19th century. And during this time, uh, it was before and after anesthesia, so he took care of patients before the introduction of anesthesia and afterwards, uh, even during the Civil War. He also was involved in many of the uh, Civil War lessons on medical care and took these with him when he left, and also had a major impact on the changes in medical training, and I, uh, hopefully I can uh, prove that to you as we uh, uh, continue in the talk. Uh, methods, uh, this was a paper that had to have a scientific uh, bent to it. So I used search engines basically helping uh, with um, the uh, JSTOR uh, information to find biographical sources and where the papers might be located. Also reviewed the two major biographies of him, which I mentioned earlier, Maurice Shaw and Schilt. Uh, these are the two major biographies uh, which are there. Uh, I went to the archives of the University of Virginia in the uh, small special collection library, Wilson Special Collections uh, at UNC, and the Southern History and Collection there also. I reviewed most of the articles and book chapters written by him, and these were housed in the College of Physicians and Surgeons in Philadelphia. Uh, and then I went to Jefferson Medical College, which provided information. The major amount of information was that uh, Virginia Commonwealth University, the Tompkins McGraw Library, uh, which had a huge amount of data, as well as the catalog from the Medical College of Virginia, as well as the University Medical College. Um, she also provided the college catalogs, faculty minutes uh, of this, and she uh, considered uh, Hunter Holmes McGuire her hobby, so she had a huge amount of information. I also, uh, one afternoon on October 5th, 2011, had the privilege of interviewing Hunter Holmes McGuire Jr., the great grandson of uh, Dr. McGuire, which was uh, a treat. <clears throat> um, I want to cover his uh, early years, uh, speak of his medical education, uh, briefly mention uh, about three um, seminal contributions he made during the Civil War to medicine outline his contributions uh, to surgery while he was at MCV as a professor, look at his national sh leadership, the founding of the University College of Medicine, and then he had many tributes given to him after his death. Um, for those of you who do not know, uh, he grew up in Winchester, Virginia, which is uh, on I-95. 
um, or close. And um, um, interestingly enough, uh, Dr. Chitwood has been there and uh, knows this area of uh, Virginia quite well. Uh, but this was basically his home for his entire uh, life except for his brief times in Philly and New Orleans. And then um, he went to uh, Richmond um, after uh, the Civil War and was on faculty there. Um, he um, was in New Orleans when Virginia seceded from the Union and he joined the Army of uh, Northern Virginia and that is where he met uh, Stonewall Jackson. His father is very influential in his life. Um, he was Hugh McGuire, who had a, an acquaintance with Dr. Physick uh, in Philadelphia, and he received his medical degree from the University of Pennsylvania. And then he later founded the Medical College of the Valley of Virginia. Interestingly enough, uh, um, the University of Shenandoah is now uh, at least undergoing um, research to try to start a medical school in uh, Winchester, Virginia, which is fascinating to me. The school was closed for 18 years and then reopened as Winchester Medical College. It was made possible by a, a literary gift of, uh, from a literary fund of the state of Virginia. Five faculty and 30 to 40 students, which is a very high faculty to student ratio for the time, and we'll talk about that later. This allowed an instructor to be present for all the dissections that occurred. There were demonstrations of surgical cases and access to medical and surgical clinics, again, which is quite uh, unique um, for this uh, period of time in the early uh, 1800s. The course was two years. Each was eight months in length, providing adequate time for reading, study, and some recreation. This school, as I've already mentioned, was very unique. Uh, even though it had a lecture format, there was clinical instruction, bedside instruction, and demonstrations of surgical cases. And as I mentioned, most of the schools of this era taught only using a lecture format with instruction given over a four to five month period and the lecture halls, uh, the size were, sizes of the classes were huge. <clears throat> um, just personality wise, um, Hunter McGuire was described as a gentleman with unswerving devotion to truth and really unflinching courage and we'll uh, show that in a few minutes. He also was a little bit pugnacious and his wife uh, indicated that he would pick uh, sides in a dogfight, um, which uh, uh, showed at least uh, some of his uh, personalities. He uh, did a number of things. He graduated as Hunter Holmes McGuire uh, with a two-year degree from the school founded by his father in 1855. He desired further training and went north and enrolled as a student at Jefferson Medical College. And this is his signature on the matriculation uh, ledger, which they have. You can see 1855 to 1856. And you can see that it says here on the same line, a graduate of Winchester uh, Medical College, a son of Professor McGuire, and this is 1855. Um, he did not spend uh, much time there, uh, became ill, and um, he went back to, um, to uh, uh, Winchester, uh, Virginia, and taught anatomy there for two years. Uh, and this undoubtedly played a major role in his uh, life uh, as a teacher and educator uh, later on. After this period of time, he went back to Jefferson Medical College and was uh, instrumental in, again, you can see his signature uh, here. Um, and um, <coughs> he was instrumental in providing uh, a tutoring class with uh, Francis uh, Luckett and William Pancoast. Uh, these quiz classes were necessary to reinforce uh, the lectures since there were so few textbooks available to students to use and the lecture halls uh, at this time the students were approximately 250 in size at both Jefferson and the University of Pennsylvania. His sessions were immensely popular with students and Dr. DaCosta who is a contemporary uh, indicates in a book on the history of Jefferson Medical College that he lectured in the old amphitheater the medical school and was considered uh, one of the uh, uh, major uh, figures at Jefferson Medical College even though he did not graduate from there. At this time, approximately half the students in Philadelphia were from the South. Uh, it was felt that there were no great medical schools in the South and after the trial and hanging of John Brown, um, there were major demonstrations. His body was moved through the North, uh, from the South to the North and uh, the students demonstrated in the streets and because of these tensions, um, there were meetings among the Southern medical students, and about half of the medical students uh, left Philadelphia, uh, many of them back to Virginia, and uh, um, 
Dr. McGuire led, uh, at least was one of the spokespersons of this. He did speak with Samuel Gross, who was the founding uh, uh, professor of surgery at Jefferson Medical College, and um, he basically had uh, no, um, no use for these students and basically stated that those who escaped with their lives were doomed to a worse fate, total demoralization, and utter worthlessness, which I found a little bit amusing to see what Dr. McGuire accomplished later. Most matriculated MCV, Dr. McGuire stayed and completed his second medical degree at MCV. Then because of the issues around his leaving Philadelphia, there was talk about whether or not he was paid money for leading this revolt, uh, whether this was self-serving. He left and went to Tulane University where he taught for a short time. At this time, while he was in uh, uh, New Orleans, Virginia seceded from the Union. He enlisted and was assigned to the Army of the Shenandoah as the medical director of the 1st Brigade. He originally uh, in, enrolled as an infantryman, but when they found out he had an MD, he was moved as medical director. As I indicated, I will not extensively review the Civil War. Uh, my goals were much different in this paper. Uh, he did make three major, uh, or three major contributions during the war. He organized um, the medical unit and devised a method of caring for the wounded people or soldiers on the battlefield and then evacuating them. Um, so these were two major uh, things that he did. He oversaw the use of chloroform anesthesia for over 20,000 cases. There's also indication in some of the literature he uh, oversaw the anesthesia of, of 28,000 cases. And he dealt with the Winchester Accord, which uh, turned out to be really quite important. And it's thought to have at least influenced the uh, Red Cross. This was signed in 1862. Um, <clears throat> and uh, this classified uh, medical officers as non-combatants and allowed them, if captured, to remain with captured troops uh, or return to their original unit for the purpose of providing medical care. They had to wait approximately two weeks before they could return, but they were not in prison. They could care for their own sick. And as uh, Mc Hunter McGuire at least asked um, Stonewall Jackson to do this, he, when uh, McGuire first proposed this, uh, Stonewall Jackson uh, uh, gave him permission to use uh, Confederate um, supplies to care, help care for Union troops. Uh, as I mentioned, they were not considered uh, prisoners of war, and he later benefited uh, from this in 1865 after being captured. He was released, uh, told to spend two weeks not in uh, uh, his unit, and then returned uh, and finished uh, the Civil War um, in, with his medical unit. After the war, he went back to Winchester, uh, Virginia, and uh, was considered for the position of professor of surgery at MCV. It's a bit amusing because the chairman of medicine thought him too young, he was 31, and too thin and uh, gaunt for this. He was six foot three and weighed 175 pounds. However, he was appointed professor of surgery, moved to Richmond after borrowing $300 from his father, who uh, basically, uh, Dr. McGuire had no money. He was to receive a salary as professor of surgery, but was never paid. <clears throat> He started to practice with minimal income. Uh, he supplemented what little income he had, acting as a surgeon for injured opponents in duels between Union surgeons who were still in Richmond after the war. He was paid $100 uh, for his services, and uh, tongue-in-cheek, he commented about his role in these affairs that never before he had the pleasure of having one damn Yankee shoot at another. So he loved it. <laughs> <coughs> Early in his years at MCV, he took medical students and walked to Chimborazo Hospital, which at that time was a hospital of about 6,000 beds. It was the largest hospital in the South and traces its origins back to at least uh, <clears throat> the middle, the group that helped start it traces its origins back to the uh, Middle Ages. Three times a week, he would take students with him and he would walk. He didn't have a horse or carriage at this time. He took, he made bedside rounds, demonstrated surgical procedures and physical diagnosis. And it's not quite clear where he learned this from my research. He may have learned this while he was at Winchester or at Tulane because he certainly did not learn it at Jefferson. Looking at the catalog, the classes were so huge that uh, there was no way that he could have learned it there. Um, during his career, he published about 60 papers, which is quite remarkable, five book chapters 
And this is while he was making house calls and a full-time practicing physician. His first two papers are related to the Civil War. Uh, he was criticized for his care of uh, Stonewall Jackson and finally uh, published a paper outlining his care and the death of Jackson. And after this was published, there was no further talk about his uh, care of uh, the general. His second article, which uh, was the first article I pulled out uh, from him, was uh, published in 1866. This was on gunshot wounds to the joints. He used his expertise from the war to discuss the severity of these injuries and indicated that amputation was frequently preferable to saving the joint because of the high mortality associated with the latter approach, and that's in the face of the high mortality from the amputations. Um, let's see, sorry. Uh, while at MCV, he published a total of 20 articles, six related to gunshot wounds, six to urology, which later became an area of his uh, international expertise. Um, and these both were areas that he was known internationally for. He was also the uh, first American surgeon to ligate a ruptured aorta, and uh, this time he contributed a, a massive chapter to Holmes' system of surgery entitled Gunshot Wounds. <coughs> uh, this chapter is massive. It's 80 pages and details the importance of trajectory, velocity, and size of the projectile. Also, those are things that we teach our residents now in surgery, but now we talk about yaw and tumble and other things that really were not uh, important in the Civil War, but trajectory and velocity we still talk about today. He talked about all injuries to all parts of the body. There are tables from international publications talking about uh, mortality rates, injuries, as well as some of the drawings are shown here of uh, femur and the skull, uh, which uh, shows entrance and exit wounds um, in these injuries. He was also involved in professional organizations. Uh, there's no record of uh, any um, presidential addresses from these two um, areas I've gone to. This is very hard to find any information on now. As you can see from the title, it basically became uh, not important uh, about the time of his death in 1900, and this, I can it's still active, but I can find no presidential address. He was a founder and executive member of the uh, Virginia uh, Medical Society of Virginia and was the president in 1881. He also uh, helped found the Retreat for the Sick, which was a charitable institution. After a dispute with the chairperson of the board, remember I said he was a little bit pugnacious, he resigned and immediately started St. Luke's Hospital. <clears throat> this was um, one of the first private hospitals in the South. And since there were a limited number of skilled nurses, he started a nursing school at St. Luke's. This was uh, one of the only two nursing schools south of the Mason-Dixon line. First uh, class was composed of five students. His conflict at the retreat for the sick was in part the reason he resigned as professor of surgery at MCV. Also noted that his practice was becoming too large, probably more of an excuse than reality, and he could inadequately teach and lecture as he desired. He resigned uh, from MCV in 1885. During the 18 years, uh, eight years between his resignation from MCV and his involvement in founding the University College of Medicine, he held a number of important posts in American medicine. In 1887, he was president of the American Surgical Association, which is considered the oldest and most prestigious uh, surgical association in the country. Uh, during his uh, presidential address, <coughs> he stated, and this shows how he's changing in his thought process, uh, there's no science or um, art, a knowledge of which the surgeon may not someday find in use. Indeed, there's no calling which demands wider and more comprehensive information. And as I mentioned, this reflects the change uh, in the 19th century in which all medicine and science was uh, viewed as important in medicine. <clears throat> and it is a change from the early 19th century in which it was only observation and recording. And this is really where he began to realize that experimental uh, science was very important to, uh, in, uh, to uh, American medicine and was being reflected on the continent also. Um, he addressed the alumni of um, the Jefferson Medical College in 1887, um, and it's fascinating to read uh, this address. Um, 
the address is long and it's very, very enthusiastic just in the words, the way he uses them. And uh, he outlined the changes in medicine that the 19th century had brought compared to earlier when he was trained. And he listed them in, in paragraphs that basically were run-ons almost. He included treatment of the gunshot wound to the chest and abdomen, which had not been done, discoveries of Pasteur and Coke, to mention just a few advances which he cited. He also called for cleanliness and minute attention to detail in all surgical operations. And then two years later, when he was president of the Southern Surgical, which is where I gave this address, uh, he was uh, president and the organization was formerly known as the Southern Surgical and Gynecological Association. He had again, as his uh, two previous themes had been, uh, declared that cooperation and sharing of knowledge among physicians is key to bring about medical progress. He was later uh, president of the AMA in 1893, and in this address he called for clean and healthful water. He also favored quarantine uh, for the safety of citizens in the face of certain diseases and the establishment of a national board of health. He invited local medical societies uh, to increase professional uh, intelligence of local physicians and to help for the general welfare of uh, the local citizens. He wanted to see the quality of physicians improved and recommended that medical boards be strengthened. Declared that the elevation of standards of medical boards had improved the standard of medical education in the country. He also indicated that a number of medical colleges had raised the requirements for admission and especially for graduation and now felt that they had sent out people who were better equipped to practice medicine. <clears throat> During this time, uh, he produced uh, some of his best papers. In 1887, uh, he presented a paper at the Virginia Medical Society as I indicated, he was considered an, uh, an expert in uh, anesthesia and discussed ether and chloroform anesthesia and spoke of deep anesthesia, which is what we use in surgery now, but was concerned because it could result in respiratory arrest, uh, which is basically what we do now. I uh, indicated this was dangerous, but remember this time they had no way to intubate patients at this time, and he indicated this was dangerous and could result in death and indeed did. The moderator of the session praised the paper, which is uh, absolutely fascinating reading. His expertise in anesthesia and the discussion went on for over 10 printed pages, which is much different than most of the discussions of the meetings today. They've repeatedly praised his expertise in anesthesia. Two years later, he had a book on anesthesia dedicated to him by Dr. or Mr. George Foy of Dublin, Ireland, which is where he spent a number of his European vacation. The dedication in part says that his name is honored and esteemed in two hemispheres. It's dedicated as a mark of respect for his great ability as both a military and civil surgeon and as a token of personal friendship by the author. I just find the, uh, the, the length of the title a little bit interesting. Um, you can't get that on most textbooks now. <clears throat> Remember, there's a surgical paper. In both 1888 and 1890, uh, Dr. McGuire uh, presented papers of the treatment of uh, urinary bladder obstruction to the American Surgical Association. Now, this is a time in which uh, prosthetic hypertrophy caused major problems for outlet obstruction, and patients would develop um, a uh, water can um, uh, perineum in which the urine would come out the perineum. You don't see this in this country anymore, but you do see it in Africa right now. <clears throat> and uh, he presented this again at the American Surgical Association, a major forum. His impressive work, he basically, because this was obstructed, produced an artificial urethra. Now, this approach is used presently when we do a suprapubic cystostomy. Basically, the same approach that we use today. But in this, then, he would uh, put a rubber tube to keep this open. So this was kept open and then this device, a silver plug, was placed in here. This was the artificial urethra. The plug was placed in here to prevent urine from coming out. When the patient felt he needed to use the restroom, he could pull this plug 
and then would urinate because the bladder would basically, uh, uh, it would contract down because of its uh, tension when it becomes full to a certain degree, and then the patient would urinate. And this is the apparatus that was used uh, for keeping this in place. Now, there, the things I want to talk about now are basically how medical education changed in the, in the uh, 19th century. Early 19th century medical education was basically you could go to medical school if you could pay for it. The class size, the size of the, um, the these all, I'm sorry, these schools were all basically proprietary. The medical school's reputation was based upon size and not quality. Usual length of medical education was two years. Usually the sessions ran from October to March, and the same lectures were repeated each year. So the students heard them twice. In 1859, when uh, McGuire uh, enrolled at Jeff, the curriculum was five months. The two sessions were required to graduate. The class size were huge in the 250 range, and individual attention, as I mentioned earlier, was not possible. Some schools would demonstrate surgery or treatment um, but frequently um, the students uh, or an examination of the patient in front of the entire class, uh, but this was not a kind of practical education involving patient care and rarely the patients or the students got to really see a patient and really um, had minimal patient contact. Civil War demonstrated how poorly prepared patients were, the physicians were for the uh, number and type of injuries seen in the variety of, uh, of uh, injuries uh, and diseases accounted for. Most of you know that about 160,000 people, 160, people died of injury, but over 350,000 died of disease in the Civil War, and part of, this, part of this is the reason for that. <clears throat> Dr. McGuire was a significant figure in American medicine, was interested in improving medical education in the South. These two facts were key as the University College of Medicine was started. He wanted to stop the flight of the best and brightest Southern students to the Northern medical schools, and he missed teaching. So when his son, Stuart McGuire, suggested starting a medical college, he readily agreed to teach clinical surgery and be president at his son's suggestion, Stuart McGuire. During my interview with his uh, great-grandson, uh, the Dr. McGuire Jr. shared uh, the family lore behind the founding of the University Me Medical College. Dr. Stuart McGuire and a friend were discussing their desire to become professors. They thought, what a great idea to suggest to their father that uh, they start a medical school and have him be the president. They could be dean and help teach. So that's at least the family lore behind the, uh, the starting of uh, University Medical College, which I hope I can prove to you had a major impact on medicine in Virginia and maybe the U.S. This uh, slide compares uh, the medical school in 1893 when um, uh, Dr. McGuire opened the College of Physicians and Surgeons, which a year later was, was uh, named the University Medical College, or University College of Medicine, excuse me. Early 1900s, I mentioned that there was an ability to pay, large class size, lecture format, not graded. Graduation was an oral quiz in two to five months. Late 1800s, and this is 1893 is when Johns Hopkins was founded and really was the first true medical school uh, by modern standards and was where Flexner came and was really the only school that he did not criticize in his report. <coughs> uh, admission though certainly for uh, uh, McGuire School had to have a high school diploma or pass a set of exams. Um, there was individual attention, lectures, labs, and clinical demonstrations. It was graded, there were exams, and three eight-month sessions. <clears throat> uh, there are also enough faculty um, for individual attention, as well as required attendance at clinical demonstrations, which was not true in the past. They also had to attend clinics. Uh, the, pay, the students also had to have a specific grade, and as I mentioned, uh, the other thing is is that the sessions, well, there were three eight-month sessions, and these were all graded, uh, moving uh, up the ladder as you uh, improved on uh, what you'd learned in the past. This is a copy of uh, the brochure for the University College of Medicine in Richmond. This, again, I obtained in, uh, at the McGaw um, Library at uh, uh, the old MCV. But you can see it's Hunter McGuire's president, 
This is uh, after he'd had two doctoral degrees, which I'll talk about, Secretary and Treasurer. It's a three-year graded course and fourth year is free. This is at a time when the University of Virginia and MCV only had three-year curriculums. <coughs> um, the other thing is, is that notice uh, that there's a dentistry school and a pharmacy school. No other school in the country had this at all. Even Hopkins did not have this when it started. There was severe, uh, intense competition from the new school uh, caused uh, both uh, MCV and the University of Virginia to change their curriculum and at least equal this. So they moved from two to three year schools shortly after uh, the University College of Medicine was opened. I'm sorry, this is also a at least outlines the teaching equipment and the clinical facilities. And notice the number of clinics and other schools really did not have this at all. <clears throat> um, in uh, 1894, the school changed, as I mentioned, to the University College of Medicine to reflect the university tenor of the school and to have a distinctive name. The first year, the school opened with 82 medical students and 30 faculty in medicine. And so remember it, you have 250 at, at Jefferson and, and fewer faculty than this. And this was a large number of faculty. This was when the faculty at MCV was only 11. And the changes in competition caused by this school, caused by the University of, uh, College of Medicine, forced MCV to increase the number of faculty and increase the length of the curriculum. In the early 1900s, both MCV and uh, the University uh, College of Medicine had a four-year curriculum and both had much larger faculty. This is amusing as I went through uh, the uh, uh, Virginia Medical Monthly. The competition between MCV and University College of Medicine was intense and fierce and really uh, at times ugly. There's uh, newspaper articles uh, with uh, basically um, discussions of money, why MCV had state money, this did not. This was founded primarily on a proprietary basis. This still had some state money. And notice now this has three branches, which is what started in 1893 with, uh, with the University College of Medicine. Uh, at this time, the AAMC, AMA, and Carnegie Foundation were analyzing medical education and bringing pressure to improve certain schools and close others. These recommendations for improving were very financially demanding, and um, the thesis written by, uh, in his PhD thesis, uh, a PhD student at uh, College of William and Mary basically quoted, while the University College of Medicine contributed to the development of medical education within Virginia, the work of the college occurred at the wrong time was was swept into the larger, more drastic national movement in medical reform. He indicated the addition of a dental and pharmacy department may have hurt the school to survival because of the amount of money that it required to fund that. But the other two Virginia schools had adopted this model in the early 1900s. McGuire had constantly written the state legislature about state money for the University College of Medicine. However, financial needs eventually caused the merger of uh, University College of Medicine and MCV in uh, 1913, so it survived for 20 years. At the final commencement in uh, 1913, and at this time, I'll go, I'll talk about it a little bit later, but at this time, 1913, Dr. Hunter McGuire was dead. He had died in 1900 of a stroke, and we'll talk about that later. But his son, who helped him found the school, summarized the work of the college by stating it had trained over 1,100 doctors, dentists, and pharmacists, and matriculated over 5,000 students. In its 20 years of existence, its student failure rate on Virginia medical board exams had been significantly lower than the other two Virginia schools during the same period of time, which they talked about with great pride. Based upon the changes of medical education modeled at the University College of Medicine and the performance of his student, uh, Dr. McGuire had, had dramatically succeeded in his goal to improve medical education, education in Virginia. Six months after a stroke which caused Dr. McGuire to lose speech and his ability to eat, he died on September 19, 1900. He was 65. The funeral was attended by hundreds. Usual eulogies indicated his kindness and care for patients 
And one of the reasons he had such a hard time is that because he was so well known in the Civil War that he would always take care of a, of a Confederate uh, Army person, uh, even if he had no ability to pay, which uh, probably hurt him uh, financially. Sir William Osler, pictured in this slide, was a longtime friend and uh, visited uh, Dr. McGuire during his final illness and was an honorary pallbearer at his uh, funeral. Uh, McGuire and Osler had a friendship. It's uh, indicated, it's talked about three times in um, Cushing's uh, two-volume biography of Osler. And um, uh, uh, his great-grandson that I spoke with thought that, uh, that Osler had even tried to help care, help care for uh, Stuart McGuire's son in the past. Um, <clears throat> Dr. McGuire had numerous honors bestowed upon him during his life. He was awarded honorary doctorates at both the University of North Carolina and Jefferson Medical College, both of which I think I mentioned. In addition to previously mentioned local, state, and national positions, he was vice president of the International Medical Congress in 1876 and also vice president of the AMA before becoming president. Member of the College of Physicians uh, and Surgeons in Philadelphia. Four years after his birth, uh, the Hunter McGuire Memorial Association unveiled a statue of Dr. McGuire on Capitol Square in Richmond, Virginia. He's the only physician to be honored with a statue in this location, which if you've been there, also includes statues of Stonewall Jackson, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, and a number of other people. <coughs> the uh, inscription uh, reads, Hunter Holmes McGuire, MD, President of the American Medical, it should say, Association and of the American, Sur American Surgical Association, founder of the University College of Medicine, medical director, Jackson Corps, Army of Northern Virginia, an eminent civil and military surgeon, and beloved physician, an able teacher and uh, vigorous writer, useful citizen and broad humanitarian, gifted in mind, generous in heart. This monument is erected by his many friends. Three additional uh, tributes to him were held. The first was in 1922, when MCV accepted a bust of Dr. McGuire uh, by Dr. John uh, Brodnax, which now stands in the Hunter Holmes McGuire building on the uh, VCU campus. Uh, it is through this door. You can walk in here and find the, uh, the bust. The second tribute was uh, October 11th in 1935, celebrating his 100-year uh, anniversary of his birth. Two physicians, one a friend and one a former student, offered tributes uh, to him. The final tribute um, to Dr. McGuire is uh, the naming of um, the Hunter Holmes McGuire VA Medical Center in uh, eight, 1986. During my interview with his great grandson, he quipped that the VA was named for the second most famous physician in Virginia, the first being Walter Reed. At the dedication, uh, Dr. McGuire, this is his grandson, who was chief of surgery there for a number of years until a friend that I'll talk about in a minute took over as chief of surgery, <coughs> uh, and said that at the dedication, <coughs> patriotism, loyalty, reverence for valor, care for individuals, and decisive action were marks of Stonewall Jackson's surgeon. Because they are also goals of the Veterans Administration, it is fitting that the Army's General Hospital has become the Hunter Holmes McGuire Veterans Administration Medical Center. The name is more than a local courtesy. This building is, uh, I think, the largest VA, in the, uh, VA hospital in the country. It's over a million square feet. In conclusion, we can say that Dr. McGuire was an innovative surgeon who was known for expertise in anesthesia, abdominal exploration, gunshot wounds, urologic surgery. He was an educator and a writer. I think that, uh, I hope I've proven he was much more than Stonewall Jackson's surger, surgeon. Um, <clears throat> as I gave this, I wanted to thank uh, Dr. Chitwood, my wife, who helped me uh, with a lot of the slides. The pictures that you saw were hers, and the dueling uh, slide was her idea in the middle of the night. She uh, came up with this idea, so I have to give her credit for that. <laughs> Kathy Verbanek, who is a comrade in arms in the uh, dep department, uh, has helped me immensely. Uh, Dr. Hunter Holmes Wire, this was one of the most delightful afternoons of my career, spending time with him in his uh, Virginia home. And Tom Miller is the vice chair of uh, surgery at uh, now MC, or at MCV Virginia Commonwealth and took over Hunter Holmes Wire position as chief of surgery at the VA and is still uh, working at the VA. 
This is Hunter Holmes McGuire Jr., the great grandson. He's not Hunter Holmes McGuire IV. The way he became junior is that uh, his grandmother was Hunter Holmes McGuire's daughter, who also married Hunter Holmes McGuire. A different family, but he is now Hunter Holmes McGuire Jr. <clears throat> the unanswered questions that I don't have as I looked, and I can't find any documentation as I've, as I've looked through the literature and I've got to do more, more work, is the increased faculty to student ratio and where he really learned bedside teaching, the increased faculty ratio, why that was so important in his life. He may have learned it at Winchester, he may have learned it at Tulane. I can't find that information out at all. I, and I've got to look. The other thing is, and this is a real question, is where did this idea come from for three divisions within the medical school? Why was there dentistry, pharmacy, and medicine? There's no model. I've tried to at least, he spent a lot of time in Dublin. His uh, great grandson indicated that he loved the uh, surgical instruments in Ireland, stating that he thought that they were among the best and he brought them back to, to use um, for his surgery. But I cannot find uh, the answer um, to this question at all. It's frustrating and I've uh, looked and uh, hopefully I can figure this out. But if you look at other student, other medical schools in the country, no others had three divisions. An unfinished work, uh, Dr. McGuire, the great grandson, told me that all the family letters are now at the Virginia Historical Society. I've uh, read some of the letters, but not all that are in the Virginia Historical Society, so I've got to deal with this. I've tried to read some of his handwriting, and uh, it's about as impossible as mine, so hopefully I can at least learn some. And um, both he and Tom Miller, as well as uh, some other people, have uh, challenged me to at least do a much more exhaustive paper. This has been published um, in the Journal of the American uh, um, College of Surgeons in April of this year, uh, but uh, I have enough data to either uh, do a much more exhaustive paper or even a book. This I did present at the Southern Surgical. Uh, um, I won the... Uh, Joseph Donald Award for Surgical Historical Research, which is where I kind of started. It was presented at the Southern Surgical, and this is the reference. Um, it's in the archives of the Southern Surgical, but it's published as, uh, after editorial uh, development uh, in JAXA. And that's all I have. Questions? <coughs> uh, yes, uh, I have a question. Um, Okay. Um, a certainly a remarkable physician, but I have a question. Since you apparently had exposure to the paper he wrote on taking care of Stonewall Jackson, mm -hmm. um, what was the complication that led to the need to amputate his arm? I think, you know, initially he tried to treat it conservatively, and uh, he ended up with infection and really just. Uh, indicated that he really could not save, you know, the hand because it was a, it was a hand injury that he got, and he felt that he could not save it without amputating, save his life. Was, was that the same arm that he had been shot in? At yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So he essentially got. I'm sorry. He got three 50 cal wounds in that left arm. That I don't remember. Yeah, and it's it. Uh, people from Alamance County actually shot him. Mm. <laughs> so it's. Yeah. Sad. I don't. I don't remember that. The other thing is, uh, Dr. Sabat at the back, and then... Lots of neat information. Um, I, you said that you started looking at his papers. The part that I would love to know more about is him as a person, which mm -hmm. I guess you'll find in the letters. Hope so. You know, um, can you say anything about he was married, he had kids. Yeah, he was married. I think they had six children. Um, his son, Stuart McGuire, uh, who wrote, I should have mentioned, uh, he wrote a 35-page biography, um, which is um, fairly well balanced. It is where it's the best source of at least the bibliographic information of, uh, of all of his papers, and it's where I went to. That Stuart McGuire uh, was a major figure in American surgery, was, pre was uh, chair of surgery at MCV for a number of years, and uh, had a major impact in World War I uh, in the medical unit in, I believe, France. Um, and 
as I indicated, a daughter married a Hunter Holmes McGuire. Thank you.